Psalm 95 verse 1. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us come and make a no joyful noise um, with songs of praise. For the Lord is our great God. He's the great king of all gods. In his hand, he has the depth of, of the earth. The heights of the mountains belong to him. The sea is his because he made it. His hands formed the land. Oh, come. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Oh, come. For, our, uh, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. I, I, fe I feel like this psalmist was just so ecstatic about God and how wonderful he is. Um, and, and as I read through the psalm, I thought, it's, isn't that just beautiful that you can be so joyful and so happy about God. And I asked myself, when last have I been this joyful and this happy about God? And what broke my heart is the second part of the psalm, where it's like an answer that God gives. He says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Mariba, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. These two extremes, right? I'd like us to just run through um, what the psalmist did so that we can catch, I think, the idea of the psalm and that the psalm can encourage us going forward. So first, the first thing the psalmist does, and he, and he does it three times, the first thing he does is he, he calls for corporate praise. He says, guys, let's praise God. He is so amazing. And then, um, then he calls us to, to make a joyful noise to the rock. A rock is stable, right? Uh, and the, it, it's a stable and he's our salvation. He calls a corporate acknowledgement of God's stability and the ability to save. Then he carries on and he says, let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. And this time he calls for corporate thanksgiving. We are so quick to complain. There are so many things we can thank for. But we don't. Because it's easier to complain than to thank. It's, it's not good for us. But it's easy and it's more acceptable to complain than to thank. Imagine you have the, the, this braai. And, 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 and you're all chatting, and the one person starts, I'm so grateful, this is so cool, that is so great, this is so great. Normally people look at this person strange, because that is, you're weird. And we could go into everything that happens in their minds then, but that will put me on, a, on the wrong track. So then he says, let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Once again, calling for corporate praise. And then he explains why. Why should we do, be doing all this praise? And he explains that, that God, has, um, God has got spiritual authority. 
He's the great king of all gods, of everything that you would see as a god. He is spiritually, he's got all the authority. Then he carries on and he looks at creation. And he emphasized how everything was made by him. So he's got creational authority. Then he carries on and says again, Oh guys, let's worship together. Let's praise him. And then lastly, or second lastly, he goes and he shows one more very important authority that God has. He's made you. He is your creator. And that gives him authority over you. And then lastly, I think this is so beautiful. He shows how there is a personal and a caring relationship. God has a peace that he wants to give us. Right, so what did we say? We, we call all to praise because of God's stability and his ability and not our stability and ability, right? Uh, we call people to praise because of God's ultimate authority on all levels. We call people to praise because God's, of God's personal and caring relationship with us. So let's have a look at the second part of that, that um, psalm, Right? So there's a few things I want to highlight that the psalmist um, uh, said. The first thing is he calls us not to harden our hearts. What does it mean when we harden our hearts? We don't open it to, to what God wants to tell us, to what God wants to give into our lives. We don't open it up to him. We harden it. We grumble. We're not grateful for what uh, we're given. And these people, if you read that text, what had happened is God has given them so much. He has, he has given, they saved them. He's taken them, miraculously taken them through the Red Sea. He's, he's done so much for these people. And then they say, you just want us to die here in the desert because we're thirsty. There's no water. <laughs> right? And aren't we like that also? So many times God has done so many amazing things in our lives. And we're quick to forget that and quick to be reminded of what we don't have in the moment. Um, he, he carries on with, um, they had seen my work. It is not as if there was no miracle that they've seen. And the truth, truth is, every one of us has seen a miracle this morning. That first breath you took, it's his. He allowed you to have that breath. So then he highlights, I think, um, I think Mike also highlighted that in his sermon where he said, it's our hearts that are important. It's not our deeds that you see, but it's our hearts. It's not the religiosity. It's our hearts, right? And here God says, they go astray in their heart. We should check our hearts. We should always be aware of our hearts and the danger of that heart of mine going astray. And this last sentence is, although it is, it's a scary statement, they shall not enter my rest, there's something we miss. God has a peaceful rest we can enter into if we acknowledge his authority. He has a rest. It's his, it's not ours. He has a rest. Before I carry on, I just want to, Quickly just check this one word. They have not known my ways. Now that can be translated in many ways. Um, I noted down a few ways that could be translated. They've observed. They care about. They recognize. They acknowledge. They are acquainted with my ways. They are aware of my ways. That is important because Christ repeats this in a different way in the text we're going to look at just now. In John 14, verse 26, Christ talks to his disciples and he says, But the help of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will, uh, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And here comes that peace. Peace I leave with you. 
If I leave something with you, you can take it up. You can take it with you. If I leave it with you, I entrust you with it. You, you could let it lie or you could take it. But he doesn't just leave it with us. He says, my peace. It's his personal peace that he gives us. It's not, not just left there. It's, it's a personal giving that he does. He gives you the peace. And then he says, um, I give it to you twice. I give it to you so that you realize it's a personal giving. And between th those two, I give you, is a very important um, side note. Not as the world gives. How does the world give peace? You have to do something for peace. You have to meditate enough. You have to kind of, uh, I don't know, eat right. Uh, you, you have to do things, right? So the world gives you peace by you having to maintain it. Because it's your peace. It's not God's peace. God is very adamant. It's his peace. It's important to catch that. If it's not your peace, you can't do anything to create it, right? It's God's peace. It's his. Not as the world gives. It is his that he gives. And then he calls us not to let two things happen with our hearts. And I think it's important for us to think about it. He's, Jesus is very adamant. You let this happen to your heart. Let not your heart be troubled. Let, neither let them be afraid. We sometimes let our heart do things that we should never have let our heart do. Now, I'm not saying that you'll never be troubled and never be afraid. What I'm saying is be aware that sometimes you let it happen. Right? Let's have a look at troubled. Why do we get troubled? I think the core reason for why we get troubled is because we get tricked in thinking that we are the center of the universe. Everything around me happens because of me. I may not say certain things because what if it happens, right? Because I'm the center of the universe. <laughs> I'll always be grateful to my wife that one day said to me, where's God in that equation? Because you become God, right? We, we are so inclined to become God in our own minds. And, and we put ourselves in the center of the universe, asking ourselves, uh, so when it goes right, uh, what should other people do that I did that would make them more joyful and happy? And when things go wrong, you ask, what have I done wrong that these things go wrong? I will always be blessed by a discussion I had with Peter Foster. He said to me the following words, and I will never, ever forget these words. He said to me, what happens to me today has got absolutely nothing to do with my relationship with God. He understood, I'm not the center of the universe. God is. And as soon as we take God out of the center of the universe, our hearts will get troubled. So, we read that also uh, in Matthew 6, verse 34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Right? We very easily get so busy with everything in the future around us uh, that cause trouble. And that anxiousness, that is a fear, right? So let's have a look at the, the second thing he says. We should not allow our hearts to do. We should not allow our hearts to be afraid, right? I, I just finished um, a book that, um, uh, it's, yeah, uh, <laughs> by C.S. Lewis, The Screwtape Letters. Now, some people think this is weird, but he wrote um, this book where he... he makes fun of demons. Um, so he writes this discussion between a senior demon and a junior demon and how they talk about how they're going to mess up people's lives, right? 
Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a difficult read at times, but it, it, there's so much to learn in that. And one of the discussions, the senior demon says to the junior demon, there's nothing like suspense and anxiety for barricading a human's mind against the enemy, meaning God, right? Um, he wants men to be concerned with what they do, so with the present. What am I doing about it here? What am I doing here, right? Uh, our business is keep, to keep them thinking about what will happen to them. We're often so busy with all the thousand different things that could go wrong, that could happen to us, right? Instead of just focusing on what does God want me to do here now? You see, you can carry the burden of the now, but you can't carry the burden of thousand different possible nows. You can only carry what's on your shoulder now. And that's the only thing God requires. We also read in Romans 8 verse 15 to 17. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery. What does that mean? You, you have to, a slave always has to do things, right? You do not receive the spirit of slavery. To fall back into fear. You fall into fear when you feel you have to do things, not you want to do things. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You see, the answer to fear is not courage, it's love. It's a relationship with somebody that you know loves you. Somebody that you know knows best. Somebody that you can actually trust. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Suffering is part and parcel of our lives here on earth. All right? Um, I think we've also heard that <laughs> in the last month. All right? So, let, But let's, let's rewind a little bit just to make sure that we understand this text right. Um, in John 14 verse 23, Jesus starts... Uh, he answers, if anyone loves me, so if anyone loves me, so if there's love towards Jesus, he will keep my word. Now, I read this text in the past and said, oh, I must do everything he says, right? I must be perfect, right? So let's have a look at what that word keep means there. If you look at its translation, you see it's to God, keep an eye upon to prevent escaping from you. It implies a fortress full, um, or full military line. So you're protecting it. You want his word to be protected within you and be part of you. You note it. You, you serve it. You watch it. You hold it fast. It's not about perfection. It's about that inner desire to live the Jesus way, right? As we were singing. That inner desire to have that. Right. And then he says, and my father will love him. So it starts with us loving him. The word is in it. The father loves us. How amazing. As if that is not amazing enough, Christ says, and we will come and make our home in him. As intimate as you possibly can be. You can't be more intimate than that. Then he carries on with that scary section, whoever does not love me, does not keep my words. In other words, doesn't care about it, lets it go, forgets it, doesn't care about the word at all. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. It has got absolute authority. The, these things I've spoken to you while I am still with you. And then he carries on, but the helper. This is a person. The person is the Holy Spirit, right? He says, whom it is a person, the Father will send. So the Father sends the Holy Spirit. Um, before we go to do what, let's look in what style he sends him. In my name. 
I just want to stop there a little bit because I struggled with this as well. We often get told to um, pray in Christ's name. And, and, and Christ makes statements, right? You'll get anything if you pray in my name. Uh, I never understood that the name is the character. If you pray in Christ's character, you will get whatever you prayed. You to have a Mercedes Benz might not be in his character. Maybe, right? Just putting it out there. Um, might not be in his name, right? And he says the Holy Spirit will teach us. He will teach us stuff. And then he will bring into remembrance um, all that he said. He will bring into remembrance all that Jesus said. That word remembrance brings us back to, will keep my word. You see, Christ is so amazing. He tells you to do something, and then he helps you do it. Right? Isn't that just awesome? Imagine he would tell you to do something and not help you do it. We would all be failing all the time, right? Uh, and it takes so much pressure off our hearts. Because you're not the center of the universe. It's him. It's him. Then he carries on. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives to you, uh, I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Let not um, them be afraid. This reminded me of Philippians, right? I did say I'm going to go to another text, right? Um, this reminded me of Philippians 4, where we read, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Do you hear the corporate call to praise? Um, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Why? Because the Lord, because of the Lord's presence, because of his authority, spiritually, physically, in your own relational um, life. Because of him. Then he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. See, do you see again the call to corporate acknowledgement of God's stability and his ability to save? Do you see again the call to corporate thanksgiving? It is so cool to see people so many thousands of years later do exactly the same. And the peace of God, not our God, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. So it doesn't make sense to us, right? Because we don't work at it, it's given, it's God's, right? It doesn't make sense to us. When it makes sense to you, you've, you've crossed, right? You, you're doing it as the world does it, if it makes sense to you. It should make no sense to you, all right? The same as we have the... It will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Let the peace of God guard your heart and your mind. And then he says, finally, and this is the last section I'll look at. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think of these things. Let's consciously decide what we want to think about and not just allow the world to drive us towards thinking about stuff. So, in conclusion, we had these three. First of all, love, right? We want to have a love that keeps our focus on Jesus' word. We want to have a love that connects us to the Father. We want to have a love that invites the Holy Spirit to create Jesus' character in us. We want to have a love that keeps us in awe of our God. We want to have a love that acknowledges His authority. And we want to have a love that acknowledges God is the center of the universe and we are not. We want to have a peace 
that is caused by love, the same love that we just had. We want to have a peace that is given to us, not deserved, but given by grace to us. We want to have a peace that belongs to Jesus, not to us. It is his peace. We want a peace that is not dependent on our ability. We want a peace that does not make any cognitive sense. It makes no sense when you think about it. We want a peace that guards our heart from being troubled and anxious. That's the peace we want. Not as the world gives, but as Christ gives. And what about joy? When we look at joy, a lot of questions come up. We want to have a joy that is a result of being madly in love with someone that loves us back. I don't know whether you've ever experienced loving somebody and realizing they don't love you. That is hurtful, right? But when you love someone and you know this person loves you more than you could ever love them, if that doesn't bring you joy, you're messed up. That's not okay, man. That's not okay. That's <laughs> okay, so John 15 verse, verse 10 um, just highlights that so beautifully. Christ says, if you keep my commandments, once again, we've got that word keep there, right? You note it, you keep it, you focus on it, right? If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you. So not only the peace belongs in, to him, but the joy also. My joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. It sounds a lot like John 14 verse 23, right? If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Let us pray. Lord, thank you that we can have, we can have this, this joyfulness because we know that you love us. Thank you that this joyfulness causes more love towards you and more praise for you, and that this praise gives us peace Lord, thank you for um, this love, peace, and joy that is unified in you. Thank you that it belongs to you, not to us. That you are the one that makes it and not us. I pray that you will remind us of this through the Holy Spirit continually. I pray that in your wonderful character, Jesus Christ. Amen.